Good afternoon. Um, my name is Brian Lenz, um, and today we are um, going to start with the part five of this series on the blended learning um, and connection to the uh, NEPS. Um, so like I said, my name is Brian Lenz. I'm currently a coordinator in Clark County School District, um, working in, as the coordinator of K-12 digital learning technology. And I'm Tambri Chondrick, the Executive Director of Operations for Beacon Academy of Nevada, um, which is a blended, it's an alternative high school that, it, that follows a blended learning model. So um, before we begin, um, because we do have a participant this evening, um, I'm, I'd like to know, Crispin, we are on the fifth domain, and I was curious if you had a you haven't watched. So Brian and I had prepared a recap that we were going to do at the end, but I think it would be helpful um, for us to flip that. And so we can talk about the four domains and then go into detail on equity if that works for you, Brian. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. Um, let me just jump ahead to our recap slide. And, and I'll take domain one. And um, in domain, what, what we're talking about in this series is when, um, I didn't ask, are you an administrator? I'm an assistant principal here at Jacks Valley Elementary. Terrific. And is your, are, do you have teachers teaching in a blended learning model at this point? No, I would say not at this point. Okay. So what we're focusing on is aligning the NEPF to doing those observations when your um, staff is using blended learning. So, so when you're going into a classroom observation and the class is blended, um, even somewhat blended or on those lessons that are blended, this the whole point of this series, um, and this is the fifth one, is to help administrators and teach, teachers who are trying to meet their performance benchmarks and then the administrators who are evaluating teachers, what are the look fors? So when you walk into a blended learning classroom, what am I looking for? And so we, we divide it in, into these five domains. Um, and the first one is data-driven instruction. And so what you would expect from a beginning blended learning teacher is that they're using a singular source of academic data. So that's what's just driving the instructional decision-making. Um, where when they're developing and, and they're learning a little bit, they're using multiple sources. And then the teacher that's more experienced in practicing is using multiple sources of academic and non-academic data um, to drive the instructional decision making, and 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 we'll talk. I'll talk you through some examples here in a minute. And then the achieving is the multiple sources of academic, non-academic data used together to always drive instructional decision making. So, as you can imagine, the beginning singular source. They're they're making their decisions on instruction, and in blended learning. Oftentimes, you're going to see students in the classroom on different lessons, different parts of the lesson, so that you know they're going at their own pace through this. Um, they may have to complete everything by Friday or you know in two weeks or something like that, whatever the the hard deadline is for that section. But at the same time, you have students in different parts. And so if the teacher were just using one assessment, let's say, to determine what the student's ready for the next day, um, that's, that's where you were seeing a, begin, a beginning, where the achieving, you know, they, they've, they have students doing maybe different levels in their class. They may have grouped them either online in the learning management system or within the class itself. So how did they determine those groups? And it was probably based on, let's say, MAP scores. Um, in addition to MAP scores, they're looking at the student's level of engagement, whether they're, you know, self-motivation. You know, those are the, 
those non-academic type of data, you know, that, that, that they're observing. And then what are they using um, to drive to drive that instruction? So in I, I do have a, a blended school. And so what my teachers are often doing is we're using map to identify where the gaps are in the learning. And then we're watching them advance through classes and they get stuck because they're, they've reached a point in the class where they, they definitely need interventions to get them through that. So when they come in, the teacher knows I'm gonna work with Johnny on lesson two and some of the other students and you know may need something else. And we use peer tutoring. We also use um, intervention as strategists, you know, those type of things. So that's what we discussed in domain one. Do you have any questions? I guess my, just thinking about blended learning, what, how are you guys defining it through this model? Because I know I might have my own perception of what that looks like, but what are, what are you guys, what's your definition and what does that look like um, when, we're, when we're just say blended learning? So by definition, it's like the students are working at their own pace, somewhat their own path their own place sometimes. Um, did I miss one, Brian? Place, yes. path, pace? Yeah, and then this is something else that we talked about, right? So like I like to talk about it in, in regards to this because a lot of times we think about technology in the classroom being blended, but really one of the things that we need to have incorporated is digital content in some, some way or form where it's not just the teacher that's delivering, tier one instruction, but students are interacting with it uh, uh, from a, a digital platform or a learning management system, something like that. And in that way, the teacher is then spending more of their time working with the students on the higher level, like Bloom's taxonomy, right? Like facilitating the learning at that level. And so whether, no matter what the model is, if it's a flip model or a hybrid school, like uh, Tammy's school where the kids are doing some of that instruction when they're not at the on the school site, but away from the teacher, then when the teacher and the students are in the same room together, they're doing those the the fun work, right? And then and then the tricky work. So the students have access right to the teacher right when they need it, and it also allows the uh, student to um, be able to work with their peers and that teacher to be able to again talking about domain one, gather that informal data just by walking around and having those conversations with the students. Those small groups are gonna be really important for the teacher to facilitate, because that's really gonna tell them in between the MAP scores, what should I be doing on a daily basis for these students? Does that make sense? Yes, it does, because I know some of it here at Jacks. I know our teachers, one of the things we've been working on is developing learning plans where, um, you take the standard, you break it down, unpack the, that standard into learning progressions. And then you have activities that are, you know, learn about it, then you practice it. And then there's that evidence of learning, which sounds like there's some elements of blended learning in there. That's why I asked that question. But, you know, obviously I haven't done a lot of research around blended learning, but it sounds like we might be doing some of it already in, in our school. So I'm glad that's one of the reasons I sort of, when I saw the title and I don't know how I missed the other four, but it sounds like you guys have been doing this for a while. So I apologize. Um, but anyway, that's what caught my attention because I know we're moving in that direction in our school where we're really trying to personalize learning for students um, based on, you know, the teacher not being the only source of, you know, they're not the only one in the classroom that can provide that um, instruction for kids, but using, you know, computers using and it's not only about computers it's you know what kind of small group instruction is happening within what kind of um, centers are in the classroom where kids are going and getting that individualized um, skills that they need so that's why I asked that question earlier because I, I just want to make sure we're I'm understanding where you guys are coming from and it sounds like we might be doing some elements but I wouldn't say we're, we're quite there well um it, it you may have told us what grade level is your we're, school we're preschool through fifth grade in this school so um 
what you may find with that grade level and is is your teachers use a lot of um it, it's just called a rotational blended model which i think i really think that's the a great direction at the elementary level and it's probably what you're seeing where um I, i'm assuming you have purchased some content for your teachers to use whether it's a math program or a reading program yes they yeah. do lucy Calkins and they're doing Eureka math. And I'm new to the elementary world. So my whole career has been secondary. So that's the other piece for me. It's like, this is my third year in elementary. So I'm learning a lot. So, but I do know we do Lucy Calkins uh, reading and some teachers do the writing piece. And then Eureka math is what the math teachers use. I I'm not familiar with those, but I'm also secondary. Brian, um, I think has a, has a broader scope of what's being used across the state. And so um, before, basically what, what I've observed when, when implementing blended learning, um, looked at different models in different schools and what I saw a lot at the elementary level is one of their stations would be set up, you know, where the students were working online and the students were where they were at. They One student was in lesson one and another student was in lesson 10. Um, and they were just progressing at their own pace, which definitely is blended learning. And then the teacher sat at a station and provided that intervention, the direct instruction that were the support as the students circulated. And so they had different activities at each station um, but it would be, let's say, a math unit. The whole the whole circuit was focused on math, right. um, and that's really the model that I've observed at the elementary level. And I think it's I, I think it's an easier place to start for elementary, or a more natural place to start because they've been doing this type of teaching all along. Um, they group their students in their class. Um, at least I I I'm assuming they do when I observed they did. And um, and so I think it's a more natural progression for them to begin to implement blended learning. And then, and then what you've probably been forced to put into place due to COVID is, how are you supporting your students when they're not on campus and have to work from home? And that's the other element that's a different blended learning model, but that's absolutely the, the, the critical piece of this is that student can continue their math lessons at home. Um, and then the teacher can set up different ways to support the student who's not in the classroom. Or maybe you have done that at the admin level where you have designated teachers or interventionists who are reaching out to students who are um, in quarantine and things like that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. All that and more. <laughs> Yeah, all the, the craziness we've dealt with. But yes, you're absolutely right. We've all had a little taste of all of that, you know, or kids. And luckily, we never really shut. At the very beginning, we shut down, but we had our, our schools open the whole time. So our students were coming every day. So that was really good. But then the students that were quarantined, we had to provide support. So yeah. 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 And, then, and then one of the other things, too, is as you're looking at, like, what that content is, um, it's important that the teachers understand what the content is doing, right? Whether if it's all at grade level and at the standard level, what's the teacher doing to support the students to differentiate that learning? Because now the program's taken care of at grade level, then that teacher may need to provide more supports for the students that are, aren't, um, are, aren't ready for that yet. So whether they're opening the class with some review or the students that are ready for more, what are they providing that, that extended? Um, or maybe you have a couple products, one that is able to go down and is more adaptive to provide that for students. But again, teachers need to understand that that's the role of the technology and not that the technology is taking over for them when to the point where they just step back and, and don't do anything anymore. Because, well, the whole, all my curriculum's online, the kids, I give them 30 minutes a day, right? We don't want that. Um, and so that's one of the things to kind of when we start talking about content's role and the teacher's role, understanding the power of both and making sure that we keep that student teacher relationship at the core of what we do. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that we've been working on this year is that 
breaking down those standards and the progressions of where students are at, whether they're, you know, emerging, developing, or, you know, they're at grade level, they're being successful and proficient, but then how do we provide the extended learning for kids? So I think our, our teachers understand that piece because of the work we've done around unpacking standards and really providing activities at each of those levels of progressions. So like that, they are being met where they're at and also providing that differentiation that they need. And obviously technology does, you know, we talk to our teachers, it's, you know, you have technology, there's a lot of things you can be doing to differentiate your instruction. And we've been pretty fortunate having our kids here on campus every day, but we also, you know, are prepared in case we ever have to shut down and kids have to work from home. Yeah, exactly. Well, then that leads, really naturally into the next domain when we talk about varied uh, learning experiences. And so one of the things that we want to make sure that we're doing is providing those un unique and choice for students to be able to um, show their demonstration of knowledge that they understand the concepts and also gain the knowledge. Um, and so th at the beginning and developing level, you're going to see either there's no variation whatsoever. It's everyone's on the same path and it's totally teacher driven. Um, and typically that, you know, that's our secondary focus is, is we see a lot more of that, right, where it's, well, I love biology, so I'm going to lecture for biology for 45 minutes, then the last 10 minutes I'll ask if you got questions and then describe the homework. Um, we don't really want that. Um, the, at the developing, what sets it a little bit apart from the beginning stage is there is some variations, but it may just be you get to pick the worksheet that you do. Right, so it's still the same skills. There is a, it's like the illusion of choice, right? It's the same thing when I, I have a six and a seven-year-old. You get to pick carrots or peas. It's an illusion, they're gonna get their vegetables that day, right? But, but it, it's the same thing, right? Like they're eating the same way. That's not necessarily a truly authentic uh, learning, uh, very learning experience for the students. So we need to make sure that we're working in more uh, choice for them. And, and those choices should be able to see that they're extending the application and getting, again, getting into those higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and then it, at, the, at the very pinnacle, the uh, achieving level, we just wanna make sure that it's rigorous and it's, it's relevant to their world. Um, and that's, again, the st students are always at the center of what we do. Um, I like to talk about, um, I used to thought I was really cool talking about skateboarding, but when you start breaking into small groups, if I'm talking to three softball players, skateboarding is no longer relevant, right? Like, so I'd have to switch my examples, switch my things to make it more relevant and connect to them. Um, and so that's kind of what we're looking at when we talk about the varied learning experiences. And again, being able to leverage technology here is huge because if, if you're not leveraging technology, I think teachers can start to see like how overwhelming all this work would be, how big this ask would be, but that partnership is going to be really important. Absolutely. Now, will you guys be sharing this PowerPoint? Sure. Okay, cool. I'll put it in the chat. We have our other lessons up as well. Um, I can't remember the link, but we can get that for you. I'm sure Brian, do you know it, Brian, or do you want me to look for that? Uh, I can get it because you're going to take over on the next slide. I certainly am. Okay, so um, the next domain that we talked about was domain three, which has to do with so student, aid, student agency. And student agency is rapport with students, but it's also self-direction, opportunities for input, and advocating beyond self. And so... Um, we spent a lot of time focusing on the rapport with students because that was one of the big challenges teachers faced last year. And it sounds like you were able to probably have a pretty good blended program last year as students came in and out. But um, down here in Clark, we, were, we did not have that opportunity. I was able to open my school definitely sooner than CCSD, but there were still um, periods of time where we were not to have students on campus, they closed the schools. And so um, building a rapport when it's fully, a full, fully distance education model was, is very challenging. 
And that is a challenge faced throughout from admin to support staff, your social workers, everybody in between. That, that's very challenging and that requires a lot of communication, a lot of outreach. Um, but the difference with blended learning is they, they, are, they are putting in face-to-face -face time. Um, I think the biggest difference is you definitely know there's a teacher involved when you're in a blended learning program. You're seeing the teacher, you're meeting with the teacher. Um, if at times you're not meeting with the teacher face-to-face, -face, at least you have access to that teacher. It's not one of those programs where you've enrolled in and self-paced through and sometimes somebody answers your question and sometimes they don't. Um, we're definitely talking about a hybrid model where, where they're coming in. And so at the student agency level, the ultimate goal is really to get students to advocate you know, for themselves. This is what I need to be successful, um, whether they're talking about the academic and the non-academic, um, and not only just for themselves, but maybe the students within the class that haven't reached that level of self-advocacy or even beyond that extension and out into the world. Um, Another part of student agency is that the students have opportunities for input. Mm -hmm. So um, they can make informed and important decisions about their instructional experiences. Easy ways to allow this to happen is to give students choice. You can do assignment one and two, or you can do three. Um, allow them and, and do you want them to write it in an essay if, the te if, if that's not your, um, if it doesn't have to be that, if it's not an English assignment, maybe they can do a video or they can, you know, write song lyrics, whatever it may be. But giving the students that, sell, that choice, that ownership um, makes them or helps them become more motivated. And then self-direction, um, helping students you know, instead of just seeing the teacher, the teacher walks in and says, you're going to do this, then you're going to do this, then you're going to do this. It's the students become leaders and they're they're going to be the ones that say, you know, I, I'm going, these are my goals for the day. And so one of the things that we do in a very, uh, my school is alternative education students. So I have 80, over 80% 80 of my students are credit deficient they are not going to graduate on time. And so we do a ton of motivational coaching. So within one classroom, we may have English for ninth, 10th, 11th and 12th graders mm -hmm. and a teacher, but that teacher motivationally coaches and sets goals with each of those students. So the students say, I wanna finish this, this and this today. And, and then there are, Harder assignments where when students are on campus, my teachers will say, you, which parts can you do by yourself? Let's focus on the, on the three assignments that you need help with. And so um, those type of things come into play too in a blended learning pr program. And so that kind of wraps up domain three, which is about um, student agency. And then this one, um, routines and procedures, it's just good teaching. It doesn't matter whether it's blended or not. But what we talked about here was, what do we wanna see in a blended classroom? And so there's some added routines and procedures that need to be considered. Like how is the teacher preparing the students for uh, transition between um, activities, especially if they're rotating between stations, not just physically, but also do the students know what, what's expected of them at that station or when they're on the digital content? Do they get, uh, do they know how to operate when technology goes awry? Like do the, are the students a part of that? Not just the teacher able to quick think on their, on their feet, but the students know what is expected of them to do. And so um, looking at that, where you wanna see good teaching. And that's basically the, the difference uh, between beginning and developing, um, the, the teacher is really driving those routines and procedures. So they could be really strong, but if the students don't know how to own those procedures and, and know what to do, then you would say that that teacher is at the beginning developing versus practicing and achieving. Um, and you really want the students to be a part of it. You know, we've seen some really cool things where 
you know, if the Chromebooks are going to be out there in that lesson, it's like a red light, green light, yellow light system. They just push, post it on the door. So the students know green light means out and open. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the yellow means out but closed and red means it can be put away. So that way when kids come back in from recess, they know exactly what's expected of them, right? So those are the kind of practices that we want to see um, happen so that the students just are aware and can, and then the teacher can make the most of that class time. But any questions on any of those domains? Because then we'll go no, back I to think, the top. No, yeah. I'm, I'm glad. Thank you guys for going over them so quickly. And it sort of confirms some of the work we've been doing on our campus around I think we're doing a lot of, of, of these things, but we're calling it different names. But um, it's really nice, especially in domain three, talking about student ownership. That's one of the big things we've been working with our teachers and our students through those learning plans and creating data notebooks where students are taking ownership and they know the goals that they've set up and where they're at academically and what they're working, working towards. And then just what I heard you talk about those routines and procedures, we call them standard operating procedures, where the teachers come up with anything that needs to happen, either behavioral or academic in the classroom, they're working through those with the students. And then even students come up with their own after a while when they start seeing things happening in the classroom. So it's really cool to see that some of this really does align with the work that we are currently doing. We're not quite there, but it, like I said, it's, feels good to know that we're sort of on the right track for this blend of so, Yeah, so much of it is just really good teaching. And when when you have a, like I said, an elementary teacher who's been, you know, teaching in levels and, you know, doing stations or the science teacher who has standard routines, procedures, it's, it's just good teaching. And so this is just bringing in um, that the technology to help students go at their own pace to um, help them it, it prevent prevent that student from getting bored or or help that student who maybe as as Brian mentioned before isn't quite at grade level but it gives them an opportunity to go through the lesson multiple times or um, go back and say I really didn't get that. I, I'm going to go back a page where in class, that's not always, a, you're not always able and be students are embarrassed to say, I, I didn't understand. Can you explain that again? So it gives them the, the ability to own that and do that. All right, so let's scroll back up. So here, um, the domain that we're gonna focus in on today um, is with equity. So we've talked about the assessment data, the instructional rigor, classroom culture, and student agency um, as a whole. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit more, more about equity. So is this where you guys were gonna start from the beginning? <laughs> Sorry, I had to get all the way back. So we're back well, no, to the that's awesome. It, yeah, no, it made total sense. Like we talk about putting students first, right? You're our student today. So I will put those in air quotes. What you needed was to be caught up. So this makes sense. So that's just using the informal data. Oops, the fly right now. Yep. We found where, you, where your understanding was and now we're all on the same page. So I think you'll get more out of these domains uh, or specifically this domain as we go forward. Awesome. And one of the things we haven't brought up yet, but if you notice along the bottom, it has the NEPF alignment. Yes. So it has the instructional and the professional responsibilities. So it does have the standards there. And so um, we struggled as a school, uh, as I said, we operate a blended learning school um, mm -hmm. and have been in operation before the NEPF came out. And so we had built our own um, professional teacher evaluation based on it was called INACL at the time, but um, online K-12, International Association for Online K-12 Learning. And so we used those standards and developed our own rubric. Well, then the NEPF came out and we were like, oh my gosh, how are we going to use this? Everything we had done 
was um, tailor made for our school, our program, and what the teacher expectations are. Because um, a lot of what we do, as you can imagine, with alternative education students who aren't on campus 100% of the time, is we do a lot of outreach. We have to engage those students and re-engage them because they're in and out of school. So there's a lot of phone calls that go on. Um, again, I work with older students. So the majority of my students are between 17 and 20 years old, as opposed to um, your typical um, 14 to 18 year olds on a campus. And so um, when the NEPF came out, it was really challenging. And so what is this look, what does this standard look like in a blended classroom? How do we make the NEPF work for us and, and still give value for our teachers? Because the whole point was to provide, um, you want a tool that works and that your teachers can grow from. And so um, this connectedness is something that Brian and I were talking about. And then we did not develop what you're looking at, but he had been working on this too. And it just happened, we came together and found out we were, um, you know, working on some of the, some similarities. And so um, we put this series together. And so um, with domain one, and we're talking about equity and the first part is self-awareness. So the self-awareness is that the um, teacher understands that bias, is, bias exists, but not really recognizing that they have their own personal bias. And um, that, you know, I, I think we've all, we all struggle with that at times. And then recognize, the teacher recognizes personal bias and can articulate how it might impact the learning space. Um, and then we go into the next one, which is the, the teacher recognizing historical and contemporary roots of personal bias um, and regularly reflects on how individuals who are different are treated in the learning space. And then um, the achieving level, which is a comfort in leading discussions across um, lines of differences with students. And so we'll go into into more detail on the next slide. So these are some examples. The, this is what you would see in a classroom. And, and I'm guilty of the first one. I'm, I, I struggle greatly with pronouncing students' names, um, especially I, I have difficulty with the Spanish pronunciation of names. Um, and so it's, it's that is something that um, I am, you know, as a teacher, I'm well aware of, and it's something that I work on. And I write the finet, you know, I write it out so that I can say it. But um, that is definitely something. If you were to go into a class this time of year and the teacher still doesn't know their teacher's names, that might be uh, a red flag there. Um, a developing teacher, the teacher assume students who behave or are categorized in a certain way do so because of their character rather than in response to environmental circumstances. And um, that's something too, where a student can be well behaved in one class and then acts totally different in another. And it, it could be because of the other students in there. It could be because of the, the um, routines that the classroom itself, the teacher hasn't set those routines that work for the student, things like that. And then the other look for's are um, in each of these where Brian and I try to focus on what, it, what is the student doing? Are the students singled out? Um, are there lines of differences? Um, you know, whether we're talking about culture, race, sexual orientation, um, are they not represented or discussed or are they used as a way to label or divide students? And so these are just some look for's when you go into a classroom. And then Brian, um, if you wanna take over on the next slide. Yeah, sure. So what, what you're gonna look at then at the teacher at the practicing and achieving levels, what we'd like to see is the part of the, the whole structure of the class is there it's, equitable and, and thoughtful language is being used, right? When you're talking with students and the students are talking with themselves. 
So it's not just necessarily, again, teacher driven, but how, how well have the students bought into this? And so when you look at our, how are they engaged, is it age appropriate for them uh, to be engaging in the activities that celebrate their culture and, and, and the, the racial and social class or sexual orientation? And it's a positive part of the classroom and not used to divide, right? Or, or is it just you know ingrained in, in the classroom activities as opposed to, oh, hey, you know, calling out to it every single time um, and make that could make the student feel uncomfortable. And so one of the next things that we like to, to do um, around these is, all right, what, what are some questions that we could ask either in a pre or a post observation or a walkthrough with the teacher to help inform what we saw and, and get the teacher to understand um, what type of change may be needed to reach the achieving level. And so one of the first things here then is you, that you could ask is how is the teacher tracking and understanding the, the interactions with the students? Um, and, and are they even aware that, hey, when you call out this, did you, do you, are you aware that this could make a student feel uncomfortable? And, and having that open and honest conversation. And if the teachers get really defensive and, and shut down, maybe that goes back to, well, let's take a look at our own personal biases and see, like, I'm not attacking you as a person, but we need to start thinking about this from the student perspective. How can we be more inclusive? And then what are the teachers using to, to talk about and collaborate the proficiency levels for students to make sure that they're identifying these biases? So is there anything that they do when, they, when they, they're looking at um, these activities to try to say, hey, this is every single example I have is of a white male when I talk about science? Why? Right? Are you, are you talking about and in, in looking at that, right? Like, what is that message sending? Um, and then just so just having a structure in place to, to identify those things. And then are the students, um, how are they able to learn uh, appropriate language for asking questions? Like, is that part of the, the classroom rules and culture and established? And, 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 and is the teacher able to respond with uh, procedures that make sense? And then other artifacts or evidence um, that you see that create these lines of difference? Or are they being acknowledged and affirmed in, in a positive environment, in, in a positive way in the learning environment? And then uh, what do you hear in the language used in the classroom that reflects valuing differences or using differences to label or divide? So again, how is it being talked about? It's not, and I think that's where a lot of teachers are right now is, no, I talk about the differences. Great, but how? And, it, and are we singling out or dividing students that could be in a negative way? So any questions on that? That's the, like the foundational level of the equity domain. No, totally understand. Okay. Questions. Yeah, and then the, the second part is um, 5.2, the, diver the diversity and the design. And so, Brian, if you don't mind, just um, I'm going to skip over this one and just go right into it on the next slide. So the beginning and developing of diversity in the design is the classroom equitable and inclusive of all individuals. And again, are the students engaged? And so the teacher displays racial, ethnic, and cultural materials only during designated heritage months. So are they just checking the box, did that? Um, teacher overuses mainstream culture as examples of real life experience. So, um, and then the teacher does not ask students to make connections to what they are learning in, with their own lives. So again, it's very, um, it's, it's just a disconnect. It's just, it almost seems to be put in there um, because they're supposed to. It's not natural. And, um, and so that's a beginning and developing. They, they clearly need to we're, this is an identified area of growth for, for this. Um, and so difficult, but, but when, just a sidebar, when looking at curriculum and, and experiences in a blended program, these are some of the things that um, could help determine what type of online curriculum you'd want to include. Um, we have looked in my school 
um, my English teachers in particular have done a very good job of bringing in books that are more inclusive of other cultures and experiences that my students can relate to. And so we've, we've brought in, you know, different books, we're still hitting all the standards, but we're bringing in materials um, basically in, in light of this, that we want to be more inclusive, more equitable, and, and make sure that the material is represented of the students. All right, so then at the, at the practicing and achieving levels, how is the lesson being taught from an inclusive perspective? Right, so that's what we wanna see happen, that it's inclusive and reflective of, of the student population in, in the classroom. And so the teacher's using language that is positive and pulls in the, the aspects of the culture and the family background when they're working with the students. And then when you look at what's posted around the room, the, the books, as Tammy just talked about, are, are reflective of the, of the students, right? Representation matters. And so you want to make sure that you're cognizant of that, not just during, again, those heritage months, but throughout the whole year. There's no reason to contain those just to those 30 days. But that should be something that is weaved in throughout the entire uh, school year and that we want to see an asset based approach to teaching and learning. And so that way it's constantly reinforcing the, the positives of everyone's uh, culture and, and it's again interwoven into the learning experiences for those students. And then here's a couple questions to ask. So does the lesson use the students real life experiences to connect to uh, school learning to the students' lives. So again, that if, if they're able to answer yes and talk about how, then they're on their way to being at the practicing and achieving level. And then how are the racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds represented in the classroom and in the work that the students uh, create? So those things need to be connected there as well. So are we not only celebrating it in the, in the learning activities, but also in how we're asking the students to demonstrate their understanding? There's the two questions. All right, any questions on uh, 5.2? Not at this time. All right, so the next one is uh, collaborative grouping. So there's, again, here's the, the breakdown of those four and then Tammy, I'll just skip to this, zoom in on beginning and developing again. Yeah, so in a beginning classroom, um, you may see that the teachers group the students based on behavior. Um, or that they're grouping them based on um, like evolving peer groups. They're, they, they don't tend to change. So the teacher does not um, structure academic interactions between the students. So maybe they're just put together. Um, and then the students self-select so partners or small group members most of the time and um, higher achieving students are supported only with independent work. So that's a teacher, oh, you're done already? I'm gonna give you five more worksheets. So that, you know, it, to make sure you're challenged. And so um, obviously I, I'm always pointing out the, the, the teacher that has some room for growth. All right, so then when we start looking at the uh, practicing and achieving levels, how are those groups being formed? Is the teacher taking into consideration the individual interests and in, in academic needs for the students when they're making those groups? And, and that should change, right? It shouldn't be like, well, I looked at what their last year's score were and that's how they are. If, if that's their answer today, well, then maybe we need to look at it because the group should even change based on the subject that's being taught. Just because the student struggles in math doesn't mean that they're necessarily struggling in English. And so mixing and matching those groups based on the actual needs of the student is, is essential. And then are the opportunities for collaboration very uh, uh, intentional, right? Did the teacher plan it out or is, not, is it just checking the box to say, well, group work's important and I want them to talk with their peers. But is what they're doing in the groups intentional 
to the learning experience and going to help uh, the students understand the content better. And then with the students, are they able to not only work independently when they need to, but the group should change again based on the real time academic and non academic data right don't just do it by the groups but also like what what are interests, what are they selecting and then mixing and matching as needed. Um, for that. So some of the guiding questions around collaborative uh, grouping is just how often does it happen in your class? So whether or not, you know, this could be a hard one to catch in an observation and walking through unless it's one of those scheduled ones. So just having those and then having the conversation with the teacher and how they the groups are selected. Are the students always picking the groups? Is that where you're trying to throw them the, the bone and say, I'm the cool teacher, I'll let you pick your groups? Or why is that every time? All right. Um, and then uh, what is the or, or how do you use goal setting um, to determine who you're going to work with and who they should be working with? And then where are you going to be during this group work? So that's the other opportunity. It's really easy as a teacher to start going through your checklist saying, I got to get grades in, I got to do attendance, I got to do RTI, I got to do all these things in the back of their head that while the students are doing group work, what are you doing? And so that's a really good opportunity for those that teacher to be walking the room, re, reaffirming those routines and procedures and expectations during that the peer to peer, and then also being able to just listen and gather that data. Where is the current understanding as a group? Do I need to readdress something whole group before the end of this lesson? So all of that is going to be really, really important. All right, and then any questions on 5.3? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Oh, and I keep forgetting to move the slide while I'm talking. So there's there's the questions for for four, uh, five point three. Here's uh, five point four is the what is the access uh, to materials? And so um, here it is at the beginning in developing. Tammy. Thank you. So the beginning. Um, the students do not have access to the content materials assigned outside of their tiered group. Um, so again, you're, you're taking away that choice. It, it's just, here's the lesson, here's what you're gonna do. There's really no personalization to this, this type of beginning. Is it bad? Not really. If you have a teacher who's just learning to you know, use technology, it takes a long time to collect the resources and stuff. So it's just an, it's just an identified area of growth. Um, we're just talking about beginning and developing teachers. And quite honestly, I think this is where a lot of teachers were in the past year and a half where they were forced online and in a, with no notice whatsoever, no prep. And, um, you know, where any research or study, it takes, I think it's five years to implement a blended learning program. And, and we were forced to do it overnight in many cases. So, and, and that was one of the things that I'm sure your teachers struggled with and, and was definitely part of the stress was, I don't know where to go for content. What do I use? And, you know, they're looking for websites, which is very tricky. So they may only have one math assignment in their class right now. Um, these are things that they can work on to grow. And then um, next one, are the students engaged? The students are waiting for the teacher to hand out materials. Um, it's sometimes one of the things teachers do is they um, time lock their lessons. So things only open at a certain time so that students are definitely kept to a pace in a class um, because they are waiting for materials. And um, students who are absent have to, you know, they have to rely on the teacher. Um, and, and you see this even in, in your brick and mortar classroom. Some teachers are great. You know, they have their little folders. And if you're absent Monday, here's your worksheet. You know, the students walk in, they know where to go to get their materials. Others, you know, are scouring around their desk. Where are these? So again, access to materials, beginning and developing, and, and we're just talking about good teaching practices. Yeah. So then when we start talking about it at the practicing and achieving, um, one of the things that, that we notice is 
the classroom's ready and available for all learners. It's set up, you know, they may even have like, it's it's clean, right? <laughs> like I hate to, but, but in organized. Um, it, this is extremely important, especially in blended learning. And at the elementary, we love that flexible seating where the kids, maybe there's a beanbag or two over there, but if they're gonna be moving around and doing a lot more, it's even more essential that that teacher's organized. And because the kids need to know, hey, this is where I go to get this activity. This is where I can go to get this. This is where the, if the pencil breaks, I can go here. Whatever, whatever that is, it needs to be set up. So that physical design of the classroom as well needs to make sense. Are we allowing for the flow of learning with minimal disruptions when, when we need to? And the students need to be aware of, hey, this was intentional, right? The reason this is over here is you should not be in this part of the room while you're working on digital content. If you're on digital content, that part's over here. That's going to help the teacher keep students on task. It's going to help the students understand what are my expectations while I'm here. And that way the teacher can, again, focus on that small group opportunities. So that way they're limiting their disruptions while they're with those kids, because that's going to be the most powerful learning experience in, in that small group. And then using a learning management system, right? The Nevada Department of Ed has purchased Canvas for every user, that's a great great one to start. There's other ones that are out there, Google Classroom, something that's there where students and families know where to go and it's consistent and it's, and it's designed well. Um, so again, it may not be right out of the box and teachers may not be ready, but that's where we should be striving because it's gonna start to teach that self-reliance. If it's always in a consistent spot and, and, and it's readily available, your students and families are gonna be more uh, likely to use it. All right, and then how do the students uh, feel? Are they, do they feel empowered? Do, are they able to uh, express their needs to be able uh, to say, hey, this is what I need to be successful? Um, and do they do it often enough? And so, so when we start looking at the questions that we can ask, and some of these you can even ask the students, right? When you're doing your walkthrough, just talk to the student. Hey, what do you do when you're absent? Are they able to answer that question? Oh, I just look in, in Google Classroom, I look in Canvas, and, and this is where I get my makeup work. How do you see the students accessing the content materials or the physical materials? Do the students know where to go? Like, hey, if you needed another glue stick, where would you go? All right, those, those are the questions students should be able to answer as you're walking through. And then how do you see the students taking ownership for their own learning? And if, and if they're not, and they're not able to ask those things, maybe having that conversation with the teacher, we pose that same question. It's, it's, not, it's a non-threatening question. And they should be able to, hey, how do you see students being able to do this? Um, and if not, then you start having, like, okay, what can we do to facilitate that? So that way that, that student's not coming up to you while you're at your kidney table doing the individual math lesson because they couldn't find the scissors, right? Like, let's get to the part so that way you can value that time again. And then how is the, that physical classroom set up to support all the learners' needs? So those are the four strands in, in that fifth domain. That's the equity domain, right? Yep, the equity domain. So when we start looking at all these five domains, we have a few reflection questions. What are some areas of overlap that you kind of see? Are you asking me? Is this? Is yeah, this if, you, if you see any connections, yeah. It, it, this is a lot of information really fast, but. Yeah, there's tons of information. Um, I see a lot of overlap actually in some of the work that we're doing here at the school. Um, you know, we, about three years ago, we started, I don't know if you heard of Modern Teacher. Yeah. So our district adopted that and we made it our own, what we call it EPIC, where we you know, empower kids, we prepare them, inspire them and connect. That's what, you know, for EPIC. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, that student ownership and making sure that um, they are taking ownership of that learning. We're providing the, providing the teachers the tools and the students the tools that they need to sort of self-monitor that piece. Um, so I, I, through your presentation today, I really, it feels good to know that we're doing some of this work. It's funny, um, is it, how do you say it, is it Tambri? 
Is that, is that how you say your name? Yeah, uh, Tambri or Tammy is fine. So when you mentioned, you know, when you were doing this already before the NFPF, that struggle of how do you connect it, we're sort of on the other side of things where we have the NFPF and we have EPIC. And now we are like, okay, a lot of things do connect and overlap, but eventually that's going to have to be tweaked to really fit you know, what we're trying to do to modernize our classrooms for students and teachers. So in that sense, I see um, that we're doing a lot of this work already. Um, obviously, like I said, this is year three and um, hopefully in the next two or three years, we can have a pretty solid um, foundation for our teachers and students. Um, our learning management system that we're gonna start next year is Empower. So that's something that, you know, it's going to be a, a lot of help in this kind of work. And I, I encourage you guys to mention that, you know, having that LMS at the same place where students get all that information and the teachers. So I'm excited about that. So, um, no, it's exciting to see that, like I said, we are um, doing a lot of this work already, but not we're not there yet. And we're going to continue to, to build it. So. Yes, so we're almost out of time, and and I and I want to be um, thoughtful of of your time. Um, we you you logged in tonight to join us, um, and so what is it? Brian and I were just talking about where to take our presentations for the next. We have um, two scheduled, one in April and one in May. Um, is there something that we can, that, that you're looking for that maybe we can help with or prepare or include in our, in our presentations? And this is all around blended learning? Yes. Right. Hmm. That's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty deep question. <laughs> um, well, that's okay. We, we both put our emails in the chat. Okay. Um, where we're going to take our next one is really what you're talking about. Um, we had talked about doing like the implementation of blended learning. So taking a look at um, how to get this in your, you know, what you need to do to prepare your school for blended learning. And so focusing on, um, usually it's the teachers getting the teachers ready so there's a lot of professional development, there's curriculum, and then there's also, do you have the technology infrastructure for it? And um, your operations are also interesting. At the admin level, sometimes it takes a bit more flexibility in the management of your school. Um, and so what are, what are, those guidelines and things like that. So that's kind of, that's what we were thinking of focusing on. Um, right, Brian, that's, did I miss anything? Yeah, and then just trying to think of like, when, you, when you're implementing a big shift like this and, and thinking about your staff, you're gonna have some like that are ready to go and like, yes, let's do it. Then you're gonna have some of that are a little bit hesitant and like, let me just see how it goes. And then you're gonna have some of the ones that lag behind. And so how can we structure PL and, and keeping all of those mem members in mind? So that way we're, we're successful in the overall shift. It's funny you say that, because that's exactly where we started about three years ago is really understanding that, that change and understanding where each individual is gonna be at once we start moving in this direction, because it's gonna be a lot of work, it's gonna be hard and having that understanding where we know that teachers are not all going to be where we want them to be right away and having that trust in the system and that communication with all the stakeholders i think is really important um, in moving in in a direction where people are not used to obviously you know that's i think with the pandemic it really forced everybody to jump in and this is what we're doing and that was scary because nobody knew what they were doing and it, so the training piece, the PD piece that you guys are talking about, I think that's critical. Um, that's something that we've uh, we've been working on for the last three years, and we continue to work on how do we support teachers in this journey because everybody's in different places, and you know providing 
I think a lot of times what we've heard is like, well, what does this look like? How does this look like in my classroom? And maybe having some, um, you know, I don't know if you how you guys provide that on a virtual training, but maybe some examples of what this looks like in classrooms, photos of teachers, you know, and students working. I don't know, just some ideas that I'm just thinking out loud right now, but I know that's the things that I, we were hearing over time, especially when we talk about, you know, people like your specialists. When you have an art teacher, you have a music teacher, what PE teacher, what does that look like for them if we're talking about blended learning? So that's been one of the things that we've been sort of struggling with those challenges. And, you know, because with the classroom teachers, we can, you have your class, you have your students, but then when you look at, at the elementary level anyway, with those specialists, it's, it's, it's a little trickier. And I can only imagine at the high school level, I know that's, I feel like the high school is always a tough area to, to implement new change because, you know, teachers are stuck in their ways and, and, you know, they've been doing it a certain way for many years. So um, just some- well, and, it, and that, sorry to cut you off. It's not just the, the, the student, uh, teachers, right? It's the students at that point too. Absolutely. They've had 11 plus years, right? Yes, so absolutely. understanding that we're asking them to do even more in this model with ownership of their learning, there's going to be a lot more resistance the older the students are. Absolutely. So I know I think you guys are going in the right direction. I think, um, I mean, if I come up with any more ideas, I'll be more than happy to share those with you guys. But I really appreciate you guys walking through all the things that I missed. And, um, and coming up to today's presentation on equity. So um, no, it was good. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for being here. Hopefully you'll be able to join us on uh, April 6th. Yeah, so thank is, you. Is that, is that when the next one is, April 6th? April 6th, yeah. Okay. And what's and the date in May, Brian? You just showed it. But uh, I... May 11th. May 11th. Yeah. And I don't know how, how I just happened to see your guys' thing today. I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. So, well, that's good. Yeah, we're glad you're able to join. Thanks again. Well, I, I, it felt a little special. It was like one on one. So that was good. Small group instruction. That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. And I think you did share all of the presentations that you guys were going through. So I appreciate that as well. Yeah. Yep, reach you. out if you have any questions. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.